Yeah, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malion and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living, and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your wonderful presence. It is inconceivable to us how the great God of the universe would be among his people, would come to dwell with his people. Whenever two or three of us decide that we want to be with God. And we feel you here today. We know that you are in this place. And you are here to break the yoke. You are here to destroy the works of the devil. You're here to liberate the captives. You're here to minister to your people. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the anointing that teaches us all things will now be at work. I pray, O oh God, that you will anoint your servant. That, O oh God, your word will go forth with power, in simplicity, with clarity. And it will accomplish that which you please, O oh God. You are the mighty editor and redactor of the word. And I pray that you, through your sovereign move that you will distribute a morsel to each and every heart that will help us, O oh God, at a point of our need today. Have your way. I come against every work of darkness. I come against every foul spirit. And I dismiss them from this place today. In the name of Jesus. I liberate the minds and the hearts of your people. I come against every distracting thought. Every thought that rises up against the thoughts of God and against the word of God. And I bring it into subjection. And I declare that the minds of God's people are free. To obey only Jesus. Have your way today. Let your word accomplish that which you please. And we give you all the glory and anticipation. Of all that you will do. In Jesus name. Amen. I want to, I want to share a little bit today. On this story. That I believe that the Holy Spirit. Has brought to my heart. To share with you. The book of Ruth is known to many of us as a love story, but it's more than just about love. It's about a godly family that made a bad decision that cost them, that brought grief and sadness and tragedy to their lives. But who took steps, thankfully, to limit the damage 
And as a result, they experience restoration and exaltation to a higher state of blessedness than they had known before. The journey of this family, Elimelech's family, from blessedness to tragedy to blessedness, speaks poignantly today to many Christian families that experience the peaks and valleys, random fluctuations between blessing and adversity, and that includes many, if not all, families. And so I pray that as we walk along with this family in their journey, that we can glean some truth that will help our families to deal with the ups and downs of life. This story took place sometime in the period of the judges. The Bible tells us that famine had struck the land of Canaan. And a man by the name of Elimelech, who lived in Bethlehem, the same place in which Jesus was born, decided to leave town and travel north to a country named Moab in order to provide for his family. He took his family, his wife Naomi, and his two sons, Malon and Kilion, and they, they traveled north and they settled in the land of Moab. Shortly after settling in Moab, the father died. The two boys then got married to Moabite women. And exactly ten years after they left Bethlehem, the boys also died. Without, a husband to pro- without sons and a husband to provide for her, Naomi decided to return home to Bethlehem and encourage her daughters-in-law to go back to their ancestral home for the simple reason that she knew that they would not find husbands among the Hebrew men because the law had specifically barred the Moabites from entering the congregation of the Lord. We know the story. Orpah decided to return to her ancestral home, but Ruth entreated her mother-in-law that she will come home with her to Bethlehem. And despite Naomi's persuasions for her not to do so, Ruth insisted, and the two women returned home to Bethlehem. The story ends with the wonderful love story of Ruth. As she was gleaning in the fields of Boaz, she fell in love with him, he fell in love with her. They got married and became the parents and the great-grandparents of King David, who is the progenitor of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a moving real-life story written during the time of David about a family who, by all appearances, was godly. But story or not, we must understand that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So what spiritual lessons can we learn from this family's story? What mistakes can we avoid? How can the tragedy and triumph of this family Instruct us in righteousness. I hope to answer these questions today. In a few lessons I want to share that I believe is instructive, are instructive for us as families of God, as children of God. The first lesson is that we must trust God to guide every decision that we make. To trust God to guide every decision that we make. There appears to be no indication whatever that Elimelech consulted God concerning this decision 
that he was about to make. This was a man who, it appears as though famine came upon the land, and he knee-jerk reacted and said, I'm going to move to a better place. I'm going to move to Moab, to the bright lights of Moab. There was no indication that he prayed, that he prayed about the decision. The name Elimelech means, my God is king. And one would think that the very name of this man would remind him that if God is my king, I need to consult with God about every decision I make. And certainly, a decision to move from my country to another country is a decision that I should bring before the Lord. One of the reasons I love King David, one of the reasons I believe that God calls this man a man after my heart, is because this man consulted with God concerning every decision, even when the answer seems to be logical, when it seems to be a common sense answer. Like when David took his men out for work, left the camp alone, and the marauding Amalekites came and raised the camp and took David's men, their, wi their wives and all the children into captivity. When David and his men returned and they saw that their camp at Ziklag was raised to the ground, their wives and their children had gone. The men began to weep. And they picked up stones to stone David to death. Saying, how could you have done this and not left a sentry at least to guard the camp? This is when the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. And then the men said to David, well, what are we going to do? Aren't we going to get back? Aren't we going to go after the Amalekites to recover our wives and our children and our possessions? Seems the logical thing to do. David is a man of war. I return home and the camp is raised. The Amalekites have come and they've taken my wife, my children. They've taken the, the wives and the children of all the men. They've taken everything we've got and burned the camp to the ground. What option is left but to go after them to recover? David said, time out. And David, the men watched David as though he was crazy. And David walked into the tent and he went up to the priest and he says, I want you to go before God and I want you to ask God if we should pursue Amalek or not. And the priest went in before the Lord and God gave him the green light and the priest walked out to David and he says, you may pursue Amalek. And he went after Amalek and they destroyed Amalek and brought back not only their wives and all their children and all their possessions, but they brought also all that the Amalekites had stolen and rampaged from all their other military exploits. Didn't take anything for granted. He sought the Lord even when it appears to be a common, obvious, rational, reasonable decision. Yet he did not leave it the common sense. He trusted God. He put it in the hands of God. Give me direction. It does not appear as though Elimelech, whose name is my God is king, ever thought about this decision. He just knee jerk reacted. And so many Christians are in a hurry. So many Christians just take things for granted. This is a complex decision. I'll bring it before God. But this one is not so complex. I'll make it on my own. Let me tell you something. Last night, this morning, I'm, I'm spending some time in prayer. And as I was in my basement at 3 o'clock in the morning, and just waiting before the Lord, I began to wonder, what is Satan doing right now? What is he doing? And I believe the Holy Spirit prompted my heart with a thought in, answer, in response to that question. And the thought that came to my heart was this. That when we are resting, Satan is compiling his notes. 
He's getting ready for the battle that begins when our eyes open the next morning. When war breaks, he's not taken by surprise. He is not dealing with us in just happenstance, acting and reacting. Efforts do not need sleep. You and I need sleep. And so when we time us, he now sits down and he puts his notes together, analyzing us, analyzing our movements, analyzing the decisions we made, looking at our lives and drafting his strategy for us the next day, waiting for the opening. The devil doesn't need much. Paul says, do not give place to the devil. That means do not give him a ledge. A ledge is a little foothold. That's all he wants. A little opening. And he studies us. Now when war breaks the next day, he has moments when we are taking, making decisions on our own. He sees those moments. He presses in on those opportunities for him. Because that's where the opportunity for error lies. When we assume this is the way that God wants things to happen. Do not take decisions on your own. Every decision, commit them to God. Make all your decisions with the approval of Almighty God. The second lesson that we learn from this family's tragedy. It's not to be in a hurry. And this is connected to the first lesson. Not to be in a desperate hurry to change our circumstances. When I say change your circumstances, not to be in a des- in a haste. The came that this is famine. Famine has come to the land. The moment... There was scarcity of food. This man decided that he was going to move. Maybe he saw a few other people moving. Maybe he heard news that there's a better life out there in Moab. He made a decision that he was going to move. Changing his circumstances. Elimelech never sat down. To sink into his life. Into the life of the people. Had he read Leviticus chapter 26. He would have known. That God said to Moses. When he was on Mount Sinai. In the presence of God. And God was giving him all these instructions. And the laws and the rules. In Leviticus chapter 26. God said to them. That if you disobey me, if you walk not according, if you dishonor me, such and such will happen. And one of the things God said was going to happen to them is that the famine will come into the land. So Elimelech never stopped to say, hey, I may be a part of this problem. Let me stay and be part of the solution. But his response was to He did not take ownership of the fact that he was part of the problem. It was somebody else's problem. He disowned this problem. Let me get out of it. He never considered that he was part of the covenant people of God. In the covenant land of promise. And that therefore, since God flowing with milk and honey, and suddenly the milk and the honey had disappeared, something was wrong. And I need to look inside. Same reaction in source of bread. Bethlehem means the house of bread. And there was a little bit scarcity in the house of bread. And the moment the scarcity came up and left. We see it all. We see it all. We're in the church, and the moment there is a problem, up and left, somebody's gone. We never stop to say, I am part of the covenant people of God. That if there's a problem here, I am part of that problem. 
And I am going to remain here with the covenant people of God. And we are going to bring this thing to an end. We brought the curse on us. I am part of the problem. And we will work our way out with the grace of God. We will get ourselves out of this. He was in a hurry to change his circumstances. I'm often taken aback when Christian people blame the world for all the problems and blame the politicians. And our talk becomes the talk of the world. Our anxieties become the anxiety of the world. We join the unsafe at the water coolers in our workplace and our language is the same. Our expression of anxiety is the same. Our expression of, of, of anger and frustration with the government and all of these things are the same. We speak the language. We live the life. There is no difference in us. We blame everyone else for the problems in the world. Let me tell you something. The problems in the world are not the problems of the unsafe people. It's the problem of the church. Jesus said we are the salt of the earth. Not the unsafe people. We are the lights of the world. We are the lights of the world. We are the salt of the earth. Without us, there is only darkness in the world. If there is darkness in the world, it is not for us to complain about the darkness. It is for us to say what's wrong. Salt preserves. You and I are the preserving agents in the world. If the world is going into moral decay and degradation, it is not about what the politician is doing. It is not what about Tom and Dick and Harry's doing. It's not about the legislation. It's not about this group of persons and that group about, pe about people. It is about me. What is wrong with my savor? What was wrong with my soul? It has lost its savor. I'm good for nothing but to be thrown outside and to be cast on the foot. It's about me. It's about me taking ownership. What is wrong? I've discovered something a long, long time ago. I was sitting one day watching a lawn tennis game in Wimbledon. And I saw people hitting balls back and forth, back and forth. And just like that, the Spirit of God said to me, I don't know what I was thinking about that time. I was thinking maybe about the church, why the church is not moving the way it is. I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ, why the world seems to be overwhelming us, why we seem to be being pushed back all the time. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this game as the ball, all of a sudden the Spirit of God deposited this thing into me. He said, you see that person across, the ball is always in our court. It is never a problem with God. The faster we take ownership of the problems, the faster we will find a solution. Getting away is not the solution. Getting away is not the problem. There are times of paucity in the church. There are lean moments in the house of bread at times. And I thank God we had lean moments too. But moment lean moments come. There are people who will stay and say, Pastor, I'm going to fight with you. We are part of this thing. We are an organism. We are members of the same body. And we are going to fight this way, our way through. The famine is not going to last for, to the house of God. The power is going to come back to the house of God. And I'm going to be there when it comes back. And I thank God for you. I thank God for you who stayed and fought. I also thank God for those of you who are coming back. Because God is going to do something great and mighty. We're yet to see. I didn't go full time because of any other reason than to be believe. Because God is saying to me, I'm ready for you. I'm ready for this church. I'm ready to do the great and mighty things of God. I'm ready. Are you? The story is death awaits. In Moab. Things might be bad in the church. Things might not be in tip top shape in the house of in the house of God. But it's never as bad as things are in the world. Moab is a type of the world, and Moab is a place of death. I like what one man says about the church and the world. 
He said the church is like Noah's ark. The church is like Noah's ark. It's stinking. Can you imagine all those animals for 40 days? All the dung, all the excrement, all the stuff. It must have been an awful smell. He said the church is like Noah's ark, stinking. But it's still the best thing floating. Shortly after the family settled down in Moab, Elimelech died. That's what happens. My God is no longer king. My God is dead. Elimelech died. Death began to spread. One would think at that point in time, Naomi would say, you know what? My husband now is dead. I'm left alone. Let me take my two boys back to Bethlehem. And it's interesting because in Bethlehem, they had an inheritance. These were not poor people. They were not people living below the poverty line. Elimelech had an inheritance because when they returned home, the kinsman redeemer offered to redeem Elimelech's inheritance. And not only did the father have an inheritance, he offered to redeem the inheritance of the two sons, Malon and Killian. These people had lands. They were not the desperate, poor people living the basis of existence. And so the moment famine came, they up and left. Even then it would have been kind of somewhat reasonable. If at all. But they were well-to-do people. They were okay. They had inheritances. They had lands. And when Naomi returned home, which we will come to in a moment, when she was stirring in the whole village, Naomi is back. They all knew her. These were not inconspicuous people. These were popular people, well-to-do people, godly people. But their reaction was quickly to get out the moment trouble comes. And they went to Moab. And the king died. And Naomi did not return home with her two sons to say that back home we have an inheritance. Back home we have people who love us. They know us. They will take care of us. They will understand that my husband is dead. I will receive compassion and understanding and assistance. Never occur to her. You get blinded when you are in the world. The God of this world has blinded the minds Of them who are under his control. Couldn't think right. She stayed on. And she got her sons married to two Moabite women. On the not knowing, understanding that this is forbidden. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 3. No Moabite shall enter the congregation of Israel. And I don't have time to tell you about the history. Why God gave them that commandment and that prohibition. No more white. She got her children, her two sons, to get married to Moabite women. And she probably felt, you know what? They are going to convert the women. Hmm? Don't fall for that lie. I'm doing this thing, this thing for 30, 30 something years. I'm preaching this gospel. And I've seen the amount of heartbreaks and heartaches. When Christian people step out to marry unsaved people, thinking that they will win them to the Lord. It doesn't happen. You marry the devil's daughter, you'll get visits from your father-in-law. <laughs> they married them, and the boys died. You know what's interesting? I read the story over and over trying to find out why the man died, why his sons died. And God gave no reason. Don't you think God owes us a reason? Don't you think it's reasonable if you're writing a story and you're telling us that a man died? Okay, he's, we could say he's probably an old man, so he died of old age, whatever. But two young boys died just like that? They died? And we don't have a reason for their death. Why doesn't the holy inscriber of scripture, the Holy Spirit, give us the reason for their death? I'm intrigued as to how two young boys 
just like that, died. Within 10 years of going to Moab, my goddess king died. Malon, whose name means joy or song, died. Killian, whose name means favor, dies. Why? No reason. Because I believe God does not want us to get us distracted with the minutia of diseases and all of these things. God wanted to plant something in our hearts. And that is when you leave the house of God to go into the world, you are going to die. You're going to lose your joy. Your God is going to be dethroned. You're going to lose your song. You are going to die. Let me remind you what death is. Death is not just falling down and closing your eyes. That's not death. When God made Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam, the day that you eat the fruit, you're going to die. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Did they fall down? Does your Bible say they fall? So is God a liar? But they died. Once you die spiritually in the eyes of God, you are dead. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Paul is speaking to the Christians, reminding them of their past. And he said, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, now God has quickened and raised up and made to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. You are dead. Once you are disconnected from God, in the eyes of God, you don't exist. You're dead. That's what death is. They died. The day they ate the fruit, they died. They had no more communication with God. Sin had separated us between them and their God, and iniquity had hid his face from them. They were dead. When you go back into the world, you're going to die. You'll lose your song. You'll lose your joy. You'll lose. God will no longer be king. He will be dethroned. And how Christians are making that terrible mistake. The other day was the Grammy Awards. And I happened to be sitting with my book reading when the television was on. And they had whatever, the red carpet or green carpet or whatever they had, the the thing before the show. And there was Katy Perry coming in, and the interviewer from the Canadian press stopped her and asked her, well, tell us, we understand you're singing tonight. What do you, what do you have for us? And Katy Perry said, this is a girl whose parents are ministers who walked away. Katy Perry said, oh, I can't tell you, I can't disclose to you what I'm going to do. But I can tell you, it is very dark. And when I'm done, these are Katy Perry's words, when I'm done, my mother is going to have to pray for me. So I was intrigued. And I watched a little bit to see when Katy Perry came on. And if any of you saw that show, and young people, maybe some of you saw it. She came out dressed in demonic garbs like a witch, dressed as a witch. She had people behind her with horns, goat horns, the symbolic of the, of, of the devil. Standing behind her, I showed my wife, were four people dressed as Moloch. Moloch is the god of fire. Moloch is the god in the Old Testament that people sacrificed their children to. That God condemned and God brought serious judgment upon them for. Moloch was standing at the back. And at the end, Katy Perry, of her song, Katy Perry lit was lit a fire. That's the requirement of Moloch, the god of fire. Burnt at the stake. That's the symbolism of her act. I understand there's another song that she sang, some E.T. song, where the lyrics is basically saying that she wants to have sex with the devil. 
This is a girl whose parents were in, are in the house of God in ministry, but for want of the bright lights of the world, not satisfied in what God has for her and what God can use her for, want the fame and the fortune and the power that the world has to give, there's a price. And the price is death. She is dead. She is dead. And so are many and all of the Christian people who have been raised up in the house of God. And most of these people in the talent shows and the American Idols and all of these talent songs, they are raised up in the church from Elvis Presley to Michael Jackson, all of them. Sandy Patty, Amy Grant, every one of them. Where do you think they start? Right here, with a blessing of Almighty God. But somebody says to them, go to Moab. Moab has bright lights. Moab will give you fame. Moab has power. Moab will make you something. And they get there, and they all die. You can't go back to the devil's kingdom and live. Can you imagine people leaving the Egypt? Moses bringing them out. After ten plagues, bringing them out of Egypt, and they're coming out, and they're singing, and they're dancing, and they're coming out, looking out from this bondage of so many hundred years, and they're heading to this, their own land, a land flowing in milk and honey. They're singing, they're praising God, and they're marching out of this place. Pharaoh sits on his throne, and Pharaoh is aggravated. Pharaoh hears them laughing at him. They weren't laughing at him, but that's how he interpreted. That's how he saw it. That's how he saw you. That's how he sees us when we are praising God. We are laughing at him. When we are worshiping God, that's what the devil hears. He hears mockery. He hears the people of God laughing at him, mocking him. And his anger, his wrath rises up to a level. And you can you imagine somebody turning back from the wilderness? And saying, I'm going back into Egypt and I'm going to tell Pharaoh that I'm sorry I want to be in your kingdom. What Pharaoh is going to do to them? From the day you left the kingdom of darkness, Satan marked you. And you are coming back to Moab. He's luring you back to Moab. You're getting back to Moab and you think you're going to be somebody in Moab? Young people, we watch all these people. We watch all of them and we are lured by the bright lights of the world. We spend our time following these people following their lives instead of following the life of Elijah and Jesus and Moses and a great people of God who can inspire us and who can give us direction. We are following. We know more about Katy Perry and we know more about all these people than we know about the Word of God. All the world has is to offer us is death. All that Moab has is death. The Bible says, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God and he that loves the world is despised by God. That's what they found in Moab. That's what a world has to offer. Don't sell out your soul for a bowl of soup. Esau sold his birthright, and despite profuse crying, he could not get it back. Naomi came back, but only after suffering so much. After suffering so much. And that's my last point. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God never changes his mind about what he has for you. We may go into the Moab of the world, and we may lose our joy and our song, our pleasantness and our favor. Our God may be dethroned, no longer king in our lives. Tragedy may strike, sorrow, grief, and we can choose to say, I brought this upon myself, and the devil will likely tell many people, you brought this on yourself. Stick it out. Naomi said, no, you know what? I'm going to go home. Like the prodigal son, I messed up. I'm going home. I'm going to say to my father, I'm sorry. I've sinned against heaven and against you. And I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as a hired servant. I'm coming home. 
Naomi decided she was going to come home. And as she came home, the people came out. And the people began to say, is, is that not Naomi? Naomi means pleasantness. And he said, look, Naomi is coming. She's coming back. And they all came out of their houses and they all lined the streets. This was a, a popular family. Look, Naomi. And Naomi answered and said, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Mara means bitterness, sorrow. For the Lord has dealt me sorrow. She came back. And the end of the story is always the best part. She came back and God restored through Ruth, Boaz getting married, having a son whose grandson was Jesse, the father of David, who's the father of Jesus Christ. Isn't David the father of Jesus Christ? Jesus is the son of David. That's how the story ends. That's how it will end. But we have a choice. Do I remain in Moab? Do I live in that place of self-condemnation that I messed up, I'm no more worthy, and I'll stay here? I deserve this. Or will we say, God, I'm coming home? Or will we say, God, I'm coming home. I'm coming back. There is no blessing in Moab. The blessing is in the covenant place. Land of Canaan is the place of blessing. God did not promise blessing in any other nation, in any other land but Canaan. And until she returned to where she was among the covenant people in the land of promise, there was going to be no lifting of that curse. Where are you today? I believe God is calling us, some of us, to come home. 